is Dr. Marnani. I've heard so many good things about him. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Uh, he has taught the library before, but I miss you were doing something with Outlander. Yes. I miss that. And uh, well, here I am. I'll leave you with Dr. Marnani. And let's stay for the raffle because that's live. So after the movie, we'll do the raffle. Well, thank you. Um, oh, please, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm an astronomer at the university, uh, at the Department of Physics and Astronomy. We have maybe 15, 16 physicists and four or five astronomers. I'm one of the astronomers, and uh, I was asked to come and uh, talk a little bit about the future of manned space exploration. And I want to share some of uh, you know, my opinions since, like, many of you from looking out, we lived through this. And uh, uh, those of you that remember the moon landings, um, it seemed like there was a lot of things going on in the late 60s, early 70s, right? You know, Vietnam and uh, a lot of urban problems and uh, inflation was just around the corner. So despite that, this was a nice respite from all that. And it seemed like it was a, the beginning of a new age amidst all those other problems. It, it appeared that uh, we were going to the stars, and then it all kind of faltered, at least as far as manned exploration went. And so I want to talk a little bit about why that was and why maybe after 50 years we might be back on track. Okay. Um, and by the way, this is totally informal. All right, this is not a lecture. I do plenty of that at the university. I don't want to do it when I'm off. So uh, if, uh, if you have questions, please ask, raise your hand, or just talk. And I, rather, th this was a dialogue. There'll be questions at the end, too. But feel free to ask questions or make comments as we go along, OK? Really, this. It all kind of started, at least in a serious way, in 1957 when the Russians launched Sputnik. Um, we, we were having trouble with them. The H-bomb, had, they had developed the H-bomb in the mid-50s, way ahead of schedule. And so this came as a very rude awakening to the US. In, uh, in the astronomy community, and the physics community, we joked that uh, all the physics buildings at public universities kind of look alike, because they were built in the late 50s and early 60s, basically as a response to Sputnik. The US kind of panicked and threw a ton of money at physics and astrophysics because, you know, this was a real threat. And um, surprisingly, considering that this came as a shock, I mean, we were working on satellites, but we weren't ready. We put a Vanguard a little a year later, but it wasn't even as sophisticated as Sputnik. And uh, the point is we were far behind. So it was really surprising when only five years later, President Kennedy made his famous speech where he said that we're going to go to the moon before the end of the decade. And uh, in a truly inspirational way, which still gives me goosebumps, you know, we choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And that was a, you know, an amazing time. Um, of course, it wasn't clear whether this was going to happen. I mean, it's one thing to say it, but it seemed you know, 1962, was the, you know, the, the Mercury program was going on, and that's a long way from the moon. And also the Soviets uh, also had their own space program, so we actually had a space race. And uh, in 62, it wasn't clear that we were ahead. By the mid to late 60s, we had pulled ahead. But back in the early 60s, it wasn't clear whether this could be done or whether we would win this race. And so you may remember. You know, the first manned orbital missions was the Mercury program. If, if you've seen the movie The Right Stuff, that's maybe the best introduction to it. And then it was followed by Gemini. There was two people, hence the name. Okay, and as I said, the uh, Russians were also involved with their separate space program. That's Yuri Gagarin, uh, first cosmonaut, first man in space in orbital, uh, you know, that took an orbit around the Earth. Uh, John Glenn came after him. Um, and anyway, I will, I'm not going to go into the history. These are, as I said, these are personal reflections. We pulled ahead. Our, our economy was probably the main reason for that. Uh, their scientific program was just as good as ours, but frankly, we just had more money. Okay. And so 50 years ago today, 
Um, we managed to get there safely. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, a given that it would work, but it did. And I remember that day, that night, um, I was between, it was the summer between fifth and sixth grade for me. And I remember my family, uh, my brother, my parents, uh, watching it on TV, mesmerized. We had a little black and white TV. And the images, if you remember, those of you that saw it were all grainy. And, and uh, the, the, the sound was horrible. And, but I think the whole nation watched uh, kind of in stunned pride. Uh, because it was a momentous achievement, and an argument can be made that this is the greatest achievement we've achieved as a, as a species, as a culture anyway. Um, so this was followed by several other missions, okay, over a relatively restricted range of time. Over three years, we had six more missions, seven counting Apollo 13, the one, they're going to show a movie about that right after this. That's the one that didn't reach the moon. As you know, they had that problem. But you can see the landing sites. Here's Apollo 11. This, this is the Sea of Tranquility. And you can see the landing sites of the other ones. Of course, 13 is missing. And the last one in December of 72 was Apollo 17. So those six missions let 12 men walk on the surface of the moon. Each mission, if you remember, they, they were, it was a three. Each were three men missions, but two went down to the moon and one orbited the moon. And then the, the little uh, LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, I forget what it was called, the little bug-like bug thing, that's the thing that went back up to, the, to hook up with the lunar module that was orbiting with the other astronaut. Okay, so six missions, 18 astronauts, but only 12 walked on the moon. And it seemed, at least to me, I was still a kid, you know, I was maybe 14 in 1972, and it seemed like, wow, the next step is Mars, and that's going to happen before the end of the decade, and then who knows what's going to happen by the year 2000, right? But instead, it kind of all stalled. Uh, manned exploration, uh, as I said, the next step was Mars, but we never even came close to that. By the mid-70s, it was clear that the manned uh, space program wasn't going anywhere. And uh, the basic reason for that is distance. I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers, but um, the distance from the Earth to the moon is about 240,000 miles. Okay, so if you think about it, I think that's a lot, but one way of thinking about it is the Earth's circumference right, at the equator is about 25,000 miles. So that's almost like 10 times the going around the Earth, right? We have a sense of going around the Earth that can be done. I mean, maybe you've taken cruises around the Earth, right? So the moon is only basically 10 times that distance. So it's far, but not an unimaginable, unimaginable amount, okay? But Mars, okay, that's a different, that's a horse of a different color, right? Mars is 34 at the closest. It can be much farther than that, but at the closest, it's 34 million miles from the Earth at its closest approach. Okay, so that's 140 times, roughly, farther than the Moon. So if you remember, the Moon missions used to take a couple of days, two, three days to get there, you know, given the methods we were using to send people to the Moon, basically rockets and gravity. Um, so if, if you scale that to Mars, let's just say it takes two days to get to the moon, it'd be about 280, 300 days. It'd take you nearly a year with that kind of propulsion to get to Mars. So all of a sudden, it's a whole other type of trip. Okay, and uh, so the distance is a problem, and certainly the money is the problem here, okay? At, at its heyday, this is the NASA budget as a function of time. So this is the budget as a percent of the federal budget. So this is 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. So in the heyday of the Apollo program, the late 60s, okay, the NASA budget was taking up between, you know, 25 to 4.5% of the federal budget. 
All right, now remember, the Vietnam War was going on at the time, um, so it's, this was a big chunk of the federal budget. Uh, today, you see that it's kind of come down to about half a percent of the federal budget. Obviously, the federal budget is larger today, but the point is, as a net expenditure, we spent as much as eight or nine times more on NASA, given the resources, as we do today. Okay, so that was just to go to the moon. So the basic answer as to why we didn't go to Mars immediately was it was too far and too expensive. All right? I mean, if you want to try to scale this up by a factor of 140 while well, you go over 100%, then you begin to see why we were all, we, the normal people, were all naive in thinking that Mars was the next step. It's just, given the distance and the technology, there just wasn't the money to do it. Okay? So that's the basic reason why things stalled as far as manned exploration, because obviously we started exploring the solar system. In the mid-70s, you may remember the Pioneer and Voyager missions to the outer planets. Those are unmanned satellites that went to explore the outer planets. And since then, we've had dozens and dozens of uh, unmanned spacecraft exploring all the, over the solar system. I mean, recently, a few years ago, we went to Pluto even, okay? So the solar system can be explored and has been explored. That's where NASA kind of, that's the direction NASA went, but using unmanned spacecraft because of the costs involved. It's much, much, much cheaper to send a robot out there than to try to sustain a person or persons in kind of the inhospitable environment of space. And uh, up until recently, it seemed like that's where we were going to be. It was just going to be unmanned exploration of space, okay? Where the manned exploration went was basically in low Earth orbit. If you remember, we went to the shuttle program, and the shuttle program was basically a test bed to create, you know, something like the International Space Station. The Russians had their own version, if you remember the Soyuz station that they had. Actually, they had that before we did. But, you know, these are objects that are in very low Earth orbit. The space station is only 250 miles up. Remember, the moon is 240,000 miles away. The space station is basically right in our neighborhood. I mean, if you could drive your car straight up, you'd get to it in about four hours. Okay, it's that close. And so the question is, okay, I, I get that maybe it's too expensive to go to Mars, I understand that, but why are we kind of stuck in low Earth orbit? Well, one of the things you've got to worry about if you're going to try to contemplate really going beyond the Earth is that the sun uh, puts out a tremendous amount of charged particles, protons, you know, new, uh, electrons, the things that make up atoms, basically. So hydrogen is, the, the simplest atom is one proton and one electron. Take the electron away, the proton is basically a hydrogen nucleus, and the sun is continuously shooting that stuff out at speeds that can be as much as half the speed of light. And those things are like little bullets, okay? They go, they're going so fast that they go right through your body, and they disrupt any cells they run into. Now, you know, you have so many cells in your body that even if at this moment a, a fast-moving proton were to go through my body, absolutely nothing would happen. I don't even know how many trillions and billions of cells we've got, so to lose a couple dozen of them means nothing. If you go like this, you probably have destroyed several cells anyway, so it's no big deal. But a steady stream of this stuff is deadly, okay? Um, even worse than, the, and those charged particles coming from the sun are whimsically called the solar wind. It's not, it's not a wind like the air, but it's a stream of particles, okay? So the sun puts out these fast-moving particles. Even worse are things that come from space outside the solar system. It's the same thing. They're still fast-moving protons, electrons, sometimes the nuclei of heavier, heavier elements. It's the same thing the sun is doing, but instead of coming from the sun, they come from the galaxy, and in those cases, instead of being called the solar wind, they're called cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are worse because they're even faster moving, some of them have even more energy, and they can be deadly. 
Okay? So you've got to be a little careful. You can't just go out there in a spacesuit. Okay? If you were to go out in a spacesuit on a spacewalk above, you know, somewhere in the moon, for instance, or near the moon, away from near Earth environment, and we'll see why you want to stay close to the Earth in a second. But if you were to do that during a solar flare, if you're outside your capsule in a solar flare, you would die. I mean, not immediately, but you'd get radiation poisoning because that's what this stuff is. It's particle radiation, and so when subjected to enough of it, the spacesuit isn't going to keep that stuff out, and uh, you would die after a few days or a week or so. So the point is, it's not trivial to go out in space, okay? We don't have to worry about that stuff because the Earth's magnetic field, here's a a graphical representation. The blue lines symbolize the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field takes the solar wind and diverts most of it away from us. Um, sometimes the field lines get overloaded, and then this, the charged particles come streaming down the north and south poles, and that's where the aurora borealis and aurora australis comes, come from, the northern lights are basically these charged particles crashing through the atmosphere and exciting the nitrogen and oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So the point is, you've got to be a little careful. Now, if, you, if there is a solar storm, even in, even in the International Space Station, if there's a solar flare or something worse called a coronal mass ejection, then they kind of make sure they're not taking any spacewalks, even though they're inside the Earth's magnetic field, and they just go and retreat into kind of the safer parts of the capsule where there's enough metal to shield them from this stuff. Yes? Solar, well, it depends on how strong the solar flare is and whether it's in the direction of the space station. Because if, if your space station is here and a solar flare goes over there, it's no big deal. But uh, you get solar flares a few times a week. The bad ones are the coronal mass ejections. Those are much rarer. I don't know what the frequency is. You get you know, maybe a dozen a year. Those are the real bad. Those, by the way, those could be really, a really bad coronal mass ejection that hits the Earth can overload the field lines and knock out power stations on Earth. Okay? Does that happen? Yes. The, I don't know, what was it, a decade ago? The entire Northeast Canada lost power. It was coronal mass ejection that knocked out uh, a lot of the transformers. The problem there, you don't want to be scary, but uh, if you're going to worry about something from space rather than an asteroid, worry about that because a big enough coronal mass ejection, something on the scale of the Carrington event from, I think, the 1859 or 1860, could knock out the entire power grid of a continent. Okay? If that happens, that's not, okay, we're out of power for an afternoon or a couple of days. If they burn out the transformers, the big transformers at the power stations, there's only, I don't know, a half dozen or a dozen replacements. And it takes a couple months to build these things. So the point is, if a coronal mass ejection were to hit the Earth, one of the big, you know, one of these couple hundred year events were to hit the Earth and knock out a continent's worth of transformers, the big ones, not the ones on poles, right? We don't have the replacement for these guys. We would be without power. You could imagine North America being without power for two months, three months. That's not a good scenario, but that's a topic for another day. But the point is, you know, space is not a super friendly environment. So one of the reasons we stay in low Earth orbit is the Earth's magnetic field keeps us safe there. It's not a showstopper. Okay, you can build craft to kind of have safe spaces for the astronauts during flares or coronal mass ejections. But the point is, it's not trivial. You've got to think about that, and it's going to cost you money to do all that stuff. So that's kind of why we kind of stayed in low Earth orbit, just for safety's sake. And the other thing to remember is that even in the normal exploration of space, people have died. And lots of people have died, and sometimes even you know, Americans, Russians, and also non-people have died in space. That's Laika, the first dog in space who sadly died. And I remember Laika, 
And uh, like the kid in that famous movie, I never realized that Laika never came down. See, I kind of assumed that she came down, but she never did. No. No, there was no, no, the, Laika was going to die in space. It's even worse than that. Apparently, they said that she had died from the dehydration and cold, but apparently she, the current thinking is she died in the first couple of hours of overheating. So, yeah, it's a sad story. But, you know, the, the point is, if we do go back to manned exploration of space, it's naive to think that it's going to go smoothly. I mean, people have lost their lives, and sadly, that could happen again. It's not like, you know, going downtown in a bus. But, uh, so the real goal then has always been, in people's imagination anyway, the stars, right? Because all this exploration, the moon and then Mars, they're stepping stones to the stars, right? All the science fiction movies are about going to the stars and new worlds and things like that. So what would that take? Well, I don't want to get into numbers because if you pardon the pun, this is where the numbers get astronomical, okay? But if you think about, so let's do a little, let's just think about it in simple terms. If you think about the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and instead of calling it 93 million miles, you call it one unit. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is one unit. It's called the astronomical unit, but you can just call it one unit of distance. The furthest real planet, Neptune, is 30 of those units out. Okay? So we can send spacecraft. With our current technology, we can send spacecraft to Neptune and the trip. Basically, what we do is you fire rockets, you put them in orbit, then you fire orbits again, and then you use the Earth's gravity or another planet's gravity to gravitationally slingshot them around the solar system. That's how we do it. So that's why I said it was a combination of rockets and gravity. So using that technology, we can get to Neptune in maybe four years, five years. years. Okay, so let's call it four years. So the point is you can go 30 astronomical units, 30 of these units in four years. How far away is the nearest star? That's the nearest star to the sun, Alpha Centauri. It's 4.3 light years away. But how many of these units away is it? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? So the sun to Earth is about eight light minutes. Right. <laughs> Well, yeah, so it's going to be a lot. <laughs> so it's about 250,000 of those units. Okay? So let's see. If it's 30 of those units to Neptune, and it's 250,000 here, if we divide 250,000 by 30, we get about 8,000. So in round numbers, this guy is 8,000 times further away than Neptune. So if it takes us four years to get to Neptune, Four times eight is 30. That's 32,000 years. That's why we don't even talk about it now. Okay, with our technology, it would take a couple, 10, 20, 30,000 years to get to the nearest star. So that's why we leave that to the science fiction writers who invent, you know, warp drive or whatever, whatever the Star Wars they got. What is that called? They don't have warp. Warp drive is Star Trek. Hyperspace. Whatever. They have to invent something, you know, some science fiction trick to get you over there because our current technology is nowhere near that. Now, mind you, there are ideas that are workable. I mean, we don't have the technology, but we could probably develop it in 20, 30, 40 years to get us moving at maybe a tenth the speed of light. Okay, if you go a tenth the speed of light, then the trip, instead of being 30,000 years, is only 40 years. Then that becomes possible. I mean, at least you could send a person on that trip, and assuming they don't die of something in 40 years, they could actually reach there. And, and these things don't involve weird science fiction stuff. Uh, this may sound stupid, but if you build a, a rocket and you'd have to assemble it in orbit because this would require you building kind of a massive steel plate behind it. Okay, so imagine like a regular rocket. You all know what rockets look like. You build a steel plate behind it, and the propulsion mechanism is you, you throw atom bombs behind the steel plate. You let them blow up, and the momentum from the explosion drives 
the rocket forward. You do that a few dozen times, and pretty soon you're going a tenth the speed of light. Okay, when you want to slow down, you just move the shield to the front, and you throw atom bombs in front of you to slow you down. Okay, it, it, we don't have that technology yet, but it's, that is not, doesn't require any new physics. That can be done in probably 30 or 40 years. The point is that if we wanted to and the money was available, because obviously this stuff is, is going to cost prohibitive amounts of money, we could do that. So it is not impossible. So, so in other words, travel to the stars, we can't do it now. It probably costs too much to start thinking about it seriously in the next few decades, but it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Okay? And who knows what kind of new physics will come along in 50 years. Maybe we'll get you know, warp drive or hyperspace or whatever this stuff is. Okay? So, so the point is our, our dream of going to the stars is a dream, but it's not an impossible dream. Okay? It's just going to take time. And if you want to embark on that dream, you've got to take the first steps. And the first step is the moon, and the second step is Mars. Right? They say a journey of 1,000 steps be or 1,000 miles begins with one step. So we took that step in 1969, and then we faltered. And it seems like we got stuck. And up until recently, I actually despair. Recently, up until a few years ago, I actually thought I'd never see us go back to the moon. But that seems to be. That seems to have changed. Okay, so what changed it? Perhaps the most important thing, I know that Elon Musk and the private sector is interested in it, but um, it's probably going to take NASA still to get us back to the moon. And what got NASA interested again was the discovery a few years ago that there is actually water on the moon. The moon was thought to be very dry, but at the bottom of lunar craters where the sun never shines, Okay, where you're in perpetual darkness and it's about 200 degrees below zero, there are now is pretty much incontrovertible evidence that water exists. It's water mixed with other stuff, but the point is there's plenty of water there. Okay, and now all of a sudden, it's not insane to think about building a lunar base. Because obviously, the water, once purified, gives you drinking water, but more importantly, perhaps, you can use it to make oxygen. It's very easy to break up water into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, you can you know, use the oxygen to breathe, you can use the to breathe, and you can use the hydrogen as fuel. Okay, so all of a sudden it's not insane to think about establishing a base that can use as raw materials the water that is actually present on the moon. And uh, for the first time in decades, <laughs> The government, not Elon Musk, not the private sector, but the government is talking about going back to the moon. Okay? President Trump and Vice President Pence have said that they would like to, for us to be back to the moon, you know, manned, manned exploration, not unmanned, manned exploration, back to the moon by 2024. That's probably a little premature, but now I, am, I, am, I have faith again that we will, that in my lifetime, you know, hopefully a couple more decades, uh, we will be back on the moon. I couldn't have said that. If, if you had asked me that question five years ago, I would have said, I, I won't live to see it. But now I think we'll be back to the moon. And so that's our first step. Establishing bases on the moon now will get us back on track to Mars. I, I almost certainly won't live to see a uh, manned exploration of Mars, uh, the private sector that thinks they're going to do it, well, good luck, I wish them luck, but I wouldn't bet a dime on it. Uh, but maybe in 50 years, you know, without any unforeseen disasters, we should be able to get to Mars, and that would be the second step, and after that, who knows. But the point is, 50 years ago, we took this amazing first step, maybe mankind's greatest achievement, and then for a number of reasons that I tried to make clear, we faltered. We kind of stumbled. Well, 50 years later, it seems we've finally gotten up, and we're ready to take that step again and uh, maybe allow us someday to fulfill our destiny, which is to go to the stars. Thank you. At the time, wasn't there some places that were doing some research how in 69 and 72 continue that? 
price, but then that kind of fizzled when the rest of the plan issued. Again, it was, it was money. I mean, th these plans are always there, okay? Uh, especially with the, all the uh, aeronautical companies, all the aerospace companies basically have advanced programming divisions that are always, that have a bunch of ideas. So you can find plans for almost anything, including manned bases on Mars, but the big showstopper is always money, okay? That's, that's really, that's, that's what I couldn't appreciate as a child. As a child, if you start talking about, you know, four and a half percent of the federal budget, that's totally, un, you know, unintelligible. It means nothing to a child, or even a, most adults, frankly. So, so the point is, it, it would take, again, to, to go to Mars would probably take us devoting four or five percent of our federal budget. And let's face it, we can't do that at the moment. But we don't have to do that yet. We take the first step, which is the moon, and that's more plausible now. I think by the end of the 2020s, we'll be back on the moon with manned exploration at some level. And I, again, five years ago, I would have said I won't live to see it. Now I'm kind of hoping I will. Also, too, that you were talking about the nuclear, was that the rock, the one called the Ryan Project? So the there are, I, the one I'm thinking of was proposed, I'm, the, I'm sure there is, I don't know the details. The one I'm thinking of was proposed by Freeman Dyson about 20 years ago. And it said, actually, what, what political drawback is because of the test ban treaty that was signed that no nuclear explosions would take place in space. And that was kind of another... Breaking treaties is probably the easiest thing we can do. Yeah. So, again, as somebody who lived through it and remembers the images, and, you know, I personally have, like, one idea of what kind of um, um, vehicle would get us there, but I'm sure, you know, a lot has changed in 50 years, so do you have, I, I mean, have you seen prototypes or any thoughts on what uh, kind of vehicles? I've seen some of the, the, all this week there's been these marvelous shows on various, uh, you know, stations on TV, the various networks. So that's where I've seen them, because I, I, I haven't paid, I don't pay attention to this stuff. I'm actually, you know, a regular astronomer, and we don't normally think about space exploration. It's more kind of an engineering thing. But, uh, but you know, so yeah, yeah, there are these things. You, I don't know them personally, because I don't look into it, but uh, I've seen a little bit uh, on these shows that have been all over the air the last week in commemoration of the 50th anniversary. So the point is, there are plans. There are lots and lots of plans. And the question is to select the best one or the best ones and find some funding for them. Uh, I did read something in preparation for this talk. I did read something which to me seems too, uh, somebody said that basically to go to Mars, we would need 80 to $90 billion. That seems, over 10 years, that seems too little, frankly. Okay, but again, it depends what are you trying to do. A, a trip to Mars could mean a one-way trip to Mars. That's obviously cheaper than, uh, you know, bringing them back. Uh, and uh, I forget which private sector person, I don't know if it's Elon Musk or somebody that has actually gotten volunteers for this on a, for a one-way trip to Mars sometime in the late 2020s. Again, I wouldn't hold my breath about that happening. But uh, the point is you can find many people that will be willing to go there and stay there. But always remember, when these things do happen, uh, whether it's the moon or something more ambitious like Mars, don't forget the, the many people that died in our previous attempts. This is not like getting on a bus and going to Cleveland or something. It's dangerous. And there, there will, if, if we go back to manned exploration outside of low Earth orbit, most likely there will be deaths, and that's, that's part of the game. Other questions, yes? Apologies, you addressed this earlier, but why do you think it will have to be NASA rather than the private sector to take the next steps? Um, because what, I mean, I don't know for a fact, okay? Uh, I am somewhat biased uh, since I work at a university, but, uh, but basically, uh, one of the things that NASA is great about is the sharing of information, which is something the companies are a little loath to do. You know, they keep a lot of things proprietary. 
if NASA is involved, you can't do that. If you want to use their money, you can't say this is patented and I'm not going to tell you how I make water out of you know milk or something. So that that's but that's you know but maybe I'm wrong. I mean if, I'm hardly an economics expert, but you know. I know that there are private efforts. There's the, uh, what, what is that called, the SpaceX, and there's something, uh, there's another one, Amazon or something. It's just, there's several, that, again, I know this because I was looking at these documentaries this last week. Um, so the private sector is interested, but it probably would require NASA to be involved um, for the expertise and also for this business about kind of sharing knowledge. Yes? Yes, uh, manned exploration now. Now, the, the Russians, not the Soviets are gone, thankfully, but the Russians uh, have said that they want to get back to the moon by, I think, 2028, and China has said they want to have a manned presence on the moon by 2036. So the point is they're thinking about it. Yes? Two questions. Why hasn't the United States been back on the moon? Well, I mean, there there could be resources, uh, precious metals. Uh, I'm not talking about gold. I'm thinking, talking about things like titanium, nickel. Um, so, manufacturing could be easier in a low G and low gravity environment. I mean, it's it's a lot of things. Uh, but mostly it's, uh, I mean, it's not so much the space race as, there, as it once was between us and the Soviets. I think now the exploitation of the moon's resources, uh, assuming that there are there to be exploited, is something to consider. Yeah, and there are, there is a lot of titanium there, for instance, and titanium is a very precious metal. I mean, it's not precious in the sense of gold, but it's a very valuable metal. And let's not uh, be naive. There's also military implications. It's certainly easier to fire an intercontinental ballistic missile, although that's a misnomer, but it's you know, certainly easier to fire, fire a missile from a low uh, G environment than from Earth. Right, an intercontinental ballistic missile, you basically fire it and then it travels like a rock. That's the ballistic part, right? Well, it's a lot easier to get it going from the moon. Again, I, a lot of stuff that drove, see, one of the, yes, it's a tremendous, uh, uh, glorious adventure of mankind, but a lot of the stuff that drove uh, NASA and the Apollo program was military. You know, so let's not undervalue that, although I'm certainly not the person to discuss that. I don't know that stuff, but yes. So given that point, do you think that NASA will be more forthcoming with information regarding space flights than a private company? Again, it's all relative. Um, it depends. On, yeah, I mean, there are things that we don't know. Um, but I, I think that uh, they're, uh, they're going to be as forthcoming as anybody can be. How about that? Maybe not as much as we would like, but uh, more forthcoming than a private company, certainly more forthcoming than the Russians or the Chinese. So, you know. Yeah. Yes. You know, what, are your, what are your thoughts and feelings about uh, the Department of Defense and the United States government finally acknowledging that we have unknown things flying around out there? Well, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't. I'm not surprised. I mean, uh, unknown things could be very routine things that we haven't identified yet, or, in other words, unknown doesn't immediately translate to alien spacecraft. It just means literally that. They're unknown. We don't know exactly what they are. Okay, but again, uh, going back to that gentleman's point, really, um, the Department of Defense is, is no, under no obligation to tell you what they know. So they can say, oh, yeah, they're unknown. Well, they could very well know what it is and just not want to tell you about it. Um, you know, uh, I'll give you uh, one example that I know about as a radio astronomer. The world's largest radio telescope, Arecibo, in Puerto Rico. You may have seen pictures of it. It was in such movies as Golden Eye or Contact. 
okay? I mean, it's, it's identified as an astronomy facility. But when you think back, it was built by the Air Force. So why would the Air Force build the world's largest radio telescope? Well, they had the idea that maybe they, that, that telescope can be used to study the ionosphere, the charged layer of the atmosphere about 60 miles up. Their idea back then, apparently, was that maybe they could catch the signature of Russian missiles being launched, okay? So the missiles could go up, go through the ionosphere, they disturb the ionosphere, electromagnetic waves travel through the ionosphere, and a place like Arecibo could detect it, and so you'd have advanced warning of a, a Soviet strike, okay? So things like that that come out decades later Okay, I mean, that's why our receiver was built, not to study the heavens, but as an attempt, it's a failed attempt because that, that didn't really work, but it was a failed attempt to basically build an early warning uh, system to detect Soviet missiles. So, so you know, how much, you know, they, were, they never said that until recently. So. I guess I, I was just amazed that the government finally came out with something besides swamp gas <laughs> You know, weather balloons. You know, it, it was it, it astounding. It was almost like the. It was almost like there was some knowledge that we want to uh, bring our population up to speed. Well, it, it it seems to me actually, uh, maybe that's the case. But in my experience, as kind of being a scientist for almost forty years now, an astronomer, being involved in education, um, I think we're actually less sophisticated scientifically than we were 40 years ago, uh, or at least we're more vociferous about that. And I'll give you two examples. There are many people running around now that doubt that we landed on the moon, that say that this was a hoax, it's that, uh, what's his name, Kubrick filmed it in some, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. Are you gonna spend four and a half percent of the federal budget on a hoax? Are the Soviets, our mortal enemies back then, going to let you get away with it? I mean, for, you know, forget, you know, if the Soviets knew it was a hoax, they would have taken delicious pleasure in exposing it, okay? Another example is the flat earthers. I mean, I don't know what to say to that. Just, you know, you don't have to go up on a spacecraft. Go up on an airplane. You can see the curvature of the Earth. I, I mean. And this is all stuff that maybe they were always there and in the past they didn't have the vociferous social platforms that they have today for announcing their stupidity. But, um, but you know, uh, to me, this is a step backwards. I mean, you've got basketball players saying that they think that the earth is flat. I just don't know what to say to that in 2019. Yeah, another could be interpretation, because weren't the first false stars when they were discovered in one of their sounds? Okay, like, yeah, 1968. You know, some kind of it was yeah, it was kept quiet for several months because they were terrified. I mean, people were really scared. I know a little bit about this as a radio astronomer. Pulsars are rapidly rotating dead stars called neutron stars that, given their magnetic fields, emit pulses. They don't emit pulses of radiation. It's, it's like a lighthouse. They have a steady stream of radiation, but because they're spinning, each time the radiation swings by you, you see a pulse of radiation. So they're called pulsars. When they were first discovered in 1968, the pulsar uh, beat, if you will, the, the signal coming was so steady, so mind-bogglingly steady, that everybody assumed it was an alien life form, some kind of buoy or timekeeping device of an alien life form. Instead, it's just a naturally occurring object. It's just a rapidly rotating neutron star. Okay, but it was, I mean, people were worried about it for months. It was a, the British that found it, and they were, their secret services were terrified for months about this before somebody figured out, hey, this is really a neutron star. Yes? Okay. Oh, there's, there's, there's thousands of tons. I mean, we're not talking about putting a city on the moon. We're talking about putting maybe, you know, 
half a dozen people there for a few years. There's Well, I mean, you know, again, going back to the moon, don't, let's not kid ourselves. It's still going to be brutally expensive, OK? So in that sense, China is better off than, the, than Russia. I mean, we have more money than either one at the moment. Um, and uh, so, so nobody's putting up a colony. If you're thinking about a colony on the moon, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like a base with just a few people. There's plenty of resources for that. Um, you know, you don't have to, you're not going to run out of, there's not a lot of, I agree, there's not a lot of water on the moon, for sure, but there's plenty to sustain a half a dozen people for hundreds of years. Question? Other questions? What? Well, okay, right. Sorry, the thing about money is that the same idea of money, possibly money in asteroids. Yeah, yeah, that's another serious thing, is the idea of mining asteroids and of course, again, mining asteroids, it's getting to the asteroids, we've actually done that. It's just bringing the stuff back now that's the, the headache. But, uh, I mean, those of us that saw the moon landings, the, you know, uh, it was exciting. You may see them again in 10 years. And, and believe me, if I had given this talk 10 years ago, I would have not said that. I would have been very pessimistic. But anyway, got one more question now. I'm sorry, this is probably a very elementary question, but regarding the moon landing and these people who think that, you know, conspiracy theorists who think that it was fake, can you um, just explain about the filming of it, right? That, um, well, what we know. Uh, one of my older brothers, for instance, he says, oh, he remembers as a little boy, um, it being on TV and waiting um, for them to take their step. I mean, I, I don't know how accurate that memory is. Well, no, it did it, it take, it take, they opened, if I remember, and mind you, this is 50 years ago, okay, uh, they opened uh, the hatch, and then Neil Armstrong took a long time to get down that ladder. That is true. I have no idea why, you know. There, was a, there were a lot of people, a lot, not a lot of people, there were a few scientists that were worried that the surface of the moon was very powdered. Basically, the moon is bombarded by cosmic rays and the solar wind, the stuff I talked about, and so the surface is, is, is powdery. Okay, it turns out that that layer is only a few inches thick, but there were some scientists who back then, before anybody had landed on the moon, thought it might be like, you know, 10 meters thick and that the thing would just sink right through. Uh, it didn't happen. But, but you know, maybe that, I don't know. I, I do remember that it took a long time. Your, your brother is right. It took a long time for Neil Armstrong. They said they opened the hatch and then we're all waiting there, right? Nothing's happening. And what? Well, I mean, I don't know what, uh, what they did there. Could be, yeah. yeah. But I mean, to me, the, the simplest explanation is what I mentioned. You, those of us who are old enough to remember the Soviets, okay, the Cold War then was not a joke, okay? I mean, we were living under the threat of mad, mutually assured destruction, okay? We were minutes away from total annihilation. We didn't like each other, okay? We were in a race to beat them. It was a race for prestige. I mean, one of the reasons we were in Vietnam is to keep all those dominoes, if you remember, from falling, right? So we were in a race to impress third world countries to side with capitalism rather than communism. Believe me, the Soviets would have known if we were pulling a hoax. Their scientists were superb scientists. Their equipment was as good as ours. If we hadn't landed on the moon, there's no way they would let us have gotten away with it. I mean, it beggars... I mean, beggar's imagination to think that the Soviets couldn't have figured out that we were staging a hoax. Okay, and then believe me, they wouldn't have let us, they wouldn't have given us a pass on it. Well, that was back when we were building bomb shelters, too. 
Exactly. I mean, I think people forgot what the Soviets were like. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.